This is the second video in a series of videos that I'm making on Edmund Landau's Foundations of Analysis. In the first video that I made, which I eventually decided to split into two separate parts, um, I went through some of the background information, um, I introduced the, the five piano axioms and then we, uh, we looked at the structure of the natural numbers. So the natural numbers were introduced and then uh, the structure gradually developed um, throughout that first section. Uh, in this video I'm going to move on to the, the next section of, of Landau's book which is on fractions. Um, this section is fairly straightforward if you do happen to be reading uh, Landau's book then you'll probably find that you get through this section, uh, this section pretty quickly. Uh, the theorems of this section in and of themselves are fairly uh, mundane, um, kind of uninteresting uh, in and of themselves, um, but they are necessary. They're, ne they're uh, proving necessary properties of fractions uh, that allow us then to proceed on to the next part uh, of, the, of the development in order to get to our ultimate goal, which is the, the construction of the real numbers. Um, so the main interest, as I've said before, really comes from, not from the individual theorems, but really from the development as a, as a whole. And it's, it's worth bearing that in mind as you, as you go through, um, as you either watch this video or you go through Landau's book. The fractions themselves are defined in terms of uh, natural numbers and things like ordering, addition and multiplication of fractions are also defined in terms of uh, the, the concepts um, of uh, order, addition and multiplication on natural numbers, uh, which the properties of which have already been proved um, in, the, in the previous section. So naturally a lot of the, the theorems, the proofs of the theorems in this section on fractions really reduces to um, considerations on natural numbers, a manipulation of natural numbers using the, the properties that have already been proved. So in a way there's, there's not really going to be much for me to, to elaborate on and to say about the theorems. I will be picking out a few theorems here and there. Uh, I will go through a couple of proofs to give a bit of an idea about how they, they tend to go. Um, but really, it's, like I say, it's a very straightforward uh, section um, in the overall development although necessary, I, I, I feel that it's right to include it um, for the, the, the sake of completeness and, and continuity really. So let's get going. The start point for us then is uh, to actually define uh, what is meant by a fraction. So uh, by a fraction x1 over x2 is meant the ordered pair of natural numbers x1 and x2 so obviously ordered pair means that we've got to really pay close attention to the order in which these natural numbers are presented to us. Uh, X1 would correspond to what we would typically, typically call the, the numerator, X2 to the denominator. There is a kind of tacit assumption here that we, we are actually able to form these ordered pairs, um, which presumably comes from uh, something in the underlying... Um, foundational uh, principles which we're not really privy to but um, we take it as given um, we don't argue with that so from this point we we move on to um, the uh, equivalence of uh, fractions so in Landau's book there, there's no notion of equality of fractions but there is a notion of equivalence of fractions um, so definition 8 which simply says that if uh, uh, sorry, x1 over x2 is equivalent to y1 over y2 if uh, x1 y2 is equal to y1 x2 so we do have a, a notion of equality of natural numbers and x1, y2, y1, x2 all being natural numbers then these products are themselves natural numbers so this equality makes perfect sense. Um, I just want to draw a bit of attention at this stage to um, what we see here. So uh, in this particular definition the uh, numerator 
of this first fraction here is it matches up with the number here and similarly the denominator x2 matches up with the number here and also we've got the the y1 here which matches up with the number here and the y2 here obviously matches up with this number here. Okay, so what I'm wanting to point out here is how careful you've got to be with uh, the, the definitions sometimes. So for example, um, we know from commutativity of natural numbers that y1 times x2 is also equal to x2 times y1. So from this we could conclude that x1 y2 is equal to uh, x2 y1. But from this, if we had this equality, strictly speaking it wouldn't be right for us to conclude that this fraction is equivalent to this fraction. From this really we should conclude that x1 over um, and let's have a look at the configuration here. So the, the x2 here corresponded to, to this number on the end, so it's, it's going to be uh, the y1 is equivalent to x2 over y2. So actually, even though arguably these are saying exactly the same thing, there are slightly different conclusions that we draw from each one. Now, in this case, actually, you can kind of get away with it. Um, from this, you could conclude this. But the point I'm wanting to make is that uh, even if you do that, if you um, conclude this from this, you have to be aware that it's not strictly in line with the definition that you've been given. This equality allows you to conclude this. This equality according to the definition, according to strict usage of the definition, allows you to conclude this. Um, and even though you can kind of get away with it here, you could conclude this from this and conclude this from this. In general, that's not the case. So you, you can't be too loosey-goosey with the, the definitions that you, that you use. You do, really do have to pay close attention. And that's the, the name of the game with, with the, the book that we're working through here, Landau's work, um, is, uh, is strict, uh, disciplined uh, attention to detail, rather than just doing things for convenience. Um, we are working systematically through uh, deve this, this development. So if you uh, kind of start imposing your already existing beliefs uh, about natural numbers or fractions onto uh, the situation before we've actually got to the point of proving those properties then really you're going to start to get into a bit of a mess and you're not really it's not really in the spirit of the of the work so the, the key here is attention to detail and really paying uh, paying close attention to exactly what the definitions say and sticking to to what those definitions say so um, if you if you are gonna uh, play it a bit fast and loose with the definitions, all I can suggest is well, first of all, don't. But if you are gonna do it anyway, then uh, really be aware of any intermediate steps that would really need to be there to fill out the the gaps. Be aware that you're not working strictly in accordance with the definition; that you are kind of bending the rules a little bit. Um, and hopefully you won't go wrong. But the, the best policy really is to make sure that you are sticking to these definitions quite closely. Okay, so if I just get rid of that. So the next few theorems, uh, so theorems, can't remember the numbers, I think it's 37, 38 and 39. Uh, these would all show that this symbol uh, twiddle, whatever it is, is an equivalence relation.
So what that means is that uh, under this uh, definition, the fractions have a tendency to kind of clump together in, in these classes of fractions. Uh, they're what we probably call now equivalence classes, although Landau doesn't use that particular term, he just uses the term um, uh, classes of fractions. And this is going to be particularly important when it comes on to uh, rational numbers, which I'll be moving on to um, either in this video or in the, the next video. Uh, we need the, the fractions to, to group together naturally in, in this particular way to allow us to, to proceed. So the, the proofs of these are fairly trivial. I'm just going to go through the proof of theorem 39, um, really just to give an idea of the kind of style of, uh, of how uh, the theorems in this section are really proved. Um, not because it's a particularly interesting theorem, but just to give an idea of how things work. So theorem 39 is the, the transitivity aspect of this uh, equivalence relation. So theorem 37 would be uh, reflects, uh, the reflexive property, 38 is symmetric, 39 is the transitivity. So this would say that if um, x1 over x2 is similar to y1 over y2 and y1 over y2 is similar to z1 over z2, then x1 over x2 is similar, uh, is equivalent, sorry, to z1 over z2. Um, okay, so immediately from this, we can say that uh, x1, y2 must be equal to y1, x2. Again, I'm sticking very closely to this, this definition. I'm not straying uh, from that path. And from this, we can conclude that y1, z2 is equal to z1, y2. And now, if I just multiply this with this and uh, this with this, I get that x1, y2 times uh, y1 z2 is equal to y1 x2 times z1 y2. Okay, and now it just comes down to really uh, manipulation of the, the natural numbers here. So uh, using theorem 31 which is associativity under multiplication of natural numbers. Uh, on this side, I'm going to get x1 times y2 times y1 z2 is equal to y1 times x2 z1 uh, y2. And then I can use uh, what do I need to use? x1, y2, y1, z2 is equal to y1, x2, z1, y2. So this here is theorem uh, 31, and again this is theorem 31, and, theref and then using uh, commutativity I get that x1 uh, z2 y2 y1 is equal to y1 y2 x2 z1, so that's theorem 29 and then theorem 31 again, x1, z2, y2, y1 is equal to y1, y2, x2, z1. So that's theorem 31. And okay, what else do I need to do? Uh, I need to switch these two round. 
So up, up until this point, I've been doing roughly the same thing on each side, but now I'm, I'm it's going to be, uh, actually no, it's going to be the same at this stage as well. So y1, y2 equals y1, y2 times z1, x2. So that's theorem 29 applied to uh, the natural numbers in each of these uh, brackets here. And then finally, just on this side, really, so I leave this side alone, the left side, x1, z2, y1, y2 is equal to z1, x2, y1, y2. So again, that's theorem 29. Okay, so I'm, I'm keeping a check of all of the, the steps that I'm actually taking here. And from this we can conclude then because we've got y1 y2 in both of these brackets here uh, that x1 z2 must be equal to z1 x2 which is nothing other than basically this definition up here um, compare that with this then i can conclude straight away that x1 over x2 is similar to z1 over z2 which is exactly what we wanted to to prove so we find that most of the theorems relating to fractions have proofs that run along similar lines to this so reduce everything to uh, natural number terms and just manipulate the natural numbers and then go back to the the fractions right at the end so uh, hopefully you'll forgive me for not going through uh, too many of the proofs because otherwise it's going to get, um, believe me when I say it, get mind-numbingly repetitive if I was to go through every every single proof. They're fairly straightforward proofs, there's really nothing difficult about them. If you know the, uh, the properties of the natural numbers that have been proved, then uh, the proofs almost write themselves. One theorem that I do just want to, to pick out, because it's, uh, I guess it's slightly interesting, is theorem 40. So theorem 40 simply says that x1 over x2 is equivalent to x1 x over x2 times x. So this corresponds to, um, I guess, what we'd learn usually in school as being equivalent fractions, that you can uh, effectively multiply the numerator and denominator by the same number and we get um, another fraction that is um, in what we call an equivalent fraction. The proof of this is really straightforward. Um, so x1, uh, x2 times x is equal to, so uh, if I use uh, associate, uh, sorry, commutativity here, I can say that that is equal to x1, x, x2. So I'm just using um, uh, commutativity on these numbers here inside this, this bracket, which is equal to using uh, associativity now, x1, x, x2. So what we can conclude then is from this and this is that x1 x2 x is equal to x1 x times x2 and from the definition, definition 8, we conclude therefore that x1 over x2 is indeed similar to x1 x over x2 x. So it's a nice short proof um, just like the previous theorem, um, really relies on reducing everything to natural number terms. The next step for us then is to define ordering on, um, on the fractions. And this is done in the following way. So x1 over x2 is greater than y1 over y2 if... Uh, x1 times y2 is greater than y1 over uh, y1 times x2. Uh, so th there is a, a difference uh, in interpretation really between the the symbols gre greater than here because they're applying to different things. So here we've got the 
uh, greater than as, as applied to natural numbers, which is something that has, has already been introduced, it's been defined and its properties have been uh, discovered to a certain extent. Um, this is applied to fractions, so it's, uh, it's got a slightly different meaning, but we're defining the, the meaning of this greater than in terms of uh, the meaning of this greater than. So everything's fine. Uh, similarly, for, for less than, um, almost, um, well, it's a very similar statement to, to definition 9. Not really anything for me to, to elaborate on. Uh, theorem 41 uh, is quite significant despite its simplicity. Uh, it's certainly not unexpected. Uh, for arbitrary fractions x1 over x2 and y1 over y2, exactly one of the cases... Uh, x1 over x2 is equivalent to y1 over y2 or x1 over x2 is greater than y1 over y2 or finally x1 over x2 is less than y1 over y2. Exactly one of these three cases must obtain uh, between any two fractions. So what we can say here is that any two fractions can be compared and for any two uh, unequal, uh, sorry not unequal, but um, non-equivalent fractions, we can always determine uh, which is the greater and which is the, the lesser of the, the two. Definition 11, there's really not, nothing much for me to say uh, regarding this section. Uh, the theorems are really, uh, really, really trivial almost. So for example, uh, we've, we've got here definition 9. Uh, x1 over x2 is greater than y1 over y2. One of the theorems would be if x1 over x2 is greater than y1 over y2, then y1 over y2 is less than x1 over x2, which is an almost trivial theorem to, to prove, but that's one of the, the theorems that's there in the book. So I, I, I'm not going to go through all... I don't want to get, get uh, really bogged down with um, all of these trivial uh, theorems. I want to try to get through this as quickly as possible, get onto the more interesting uh, aspects. Definition 11, x1 over x2 is greater than or equivalent to y1 over y2, unsurprisingly if x1 over x2 is greater than y1 over y2 or if x1 over x2 is equivalent to y1 over y2. And similarly for less than or equivalent to, so that, that's the, the content of definition 12. So th there's not really much for me to elaborate on. Uh, with these particular definitions and, and theorem. Um, so I'm going to move swiftly on to uh, some uh, slightly interesting theorems that, I, um, that caught my eye. On the board I've written a few slightly interesting theorems, um, at least from, from this particular section on fractions. So theorem 53, uh, given any fraction there is another fraction which is greater than uh, the, the given fraction. So this is really easy to, uh, to prove. Uh, so for example, uh, x1 plus x1 times x2 is equal to x1 x2 plus x1 x2. So this is just uh, distributivity of uh, natural numbers. Again, everything is reduced to natural number terms. And that is greater than x1, uh, x2. So the conclusion is that x1 plus x1, uh, x2 is greater than x1, x2. But this is by definition, definition uh, 9, I guess. Uh, this would say that x1 plus x1 over x2 is greater than x1 over x2. So this would effectively be our z1 and this would effectively be the z2 that has been spoken of up here. Uh, the proof of the next theorem, theorem 54, which says that given any fraction there is another fraction which is less than that fraction. Um, the, the proof really goes in a, a similar direction to, to this, although it's not identical. Uh, we start with x1, uh, x2. This is necessarily less than x1, x2 plus x1, x2. 
which is equal to take out the x1 as a, a common factor so um, using the kind of distributivity uh, property of natural numbers and okay paying attention to that and that this says that uh, according to definition 10 and it, it, again paying close attention to the the exact configuration that we've got here of, of all of the the factors it tells us that x1 over x2 plus x2 is less than x1 over x2 so just as before this is the the z1 and this is going to be the z2 that is mentioned in the the statement of the theorem theorem 55 here uh, expresses a particularly interesting property of fractions uh, namely that the between any two non-equal fractions there is al always a third fraction uh, sorry non-equivalent fractions there's always a third fraction so the first uh, theorem here expresses that there's no greatest fraction this expresses that there's no least fraction this expresses that between any two fractions there is always a, a third one kind of trapped between them um, well there would be an infinite number trapped between this is what um, uh, the property that this is describing is what Cantor uh, in his work describes as um, everywhere dense I think he uses the, the phrase everywhere dense so this would be saying that the fractions are everywhere dense but Cantor uses it in relation to the uh, the rational numbers in general um, okay so let's have a look at the the proof of this it's a really straightforward one uh, from this um, here we can conclude this is definition 10 that uh, x1 y2 is less than x2 uh, sorry uh, y1 x2 and from this we, we go in two directions so here um, if I say x1 x2 plus x1 y2 is less than uh, x1 uh, x2 plus y1 x2 so all I've done here is just added uh, x1 x1 times x2 to both uh, both sides of this inequality symbol um, and notice that I've, I've done this specifically on the left I've added on the left as well um, and then I can use the distributivity of natural numbers to conclude that uh, x1 times x2 plus y2 is less than um, x1 plus y1 times x2 and from this it follows that uh, x1 over x2 is less than uh, x1 plus y1 over x2 plus y2 and similarly I can go in another direction here which is to say that uh, adding y1 times y2 to both sides of this I get that x1 y2 plus uh, y1 y2 is less than y1 x2 plus uh, y1 y2 again factorize both sides using this distributivity I get that x1 plus y1 times y2 is less than uh, y1 x2 plus y2 and then definition 10 tells me that uh, x1 plus y1 over x2 plus y2 is less than y1 over y2 so what we've got here is the same fraction here as here and that fraction is um, less than the, the y1 over y2 but it's greater than the x1 over x2 so this is the fraction that we're looking for the, the z1 over z2 
Um, so Z1, we could say that it's X plus, X1 plus Y1, Z2 is the X2 plus Y2. Don't be under any impressions that this is the only fraction that is between X1 over X2 and Y1 over Y2. This is just one of them. So all we're showing here is that there, there exists a fraction in between uh, these two. Not that it's the only one. There's, there's all kinds of fractions that are going to be between these two, but this is just showing that there is at least one, and actually it will turn out that there's an infinite number of them as well. So the next job for us is to define um, addition of fractions, and uh, addition of fractions is defined in the way shown here. Um, so x1 over x2 plus y1 over y2 um, is effectively defined as being the fraction x1, y2 plus y1, x2 in the numerator and x2, y2 um, in the denominator. So this coincides unsurprisingly um, with our kind of intuitive notation of how fractions are added together. So the way that we uh, learned at a very young age how to add fractions together, cross multiplication or however you, you might have learned it. Um, not really much for me to, to say about that. Uh, theorem 56, um, this is an important theorem in the sense that it shows that, it proves that uh, addition of fractions depends only on the class of uh, fractions. Um, these equivalence classes of fractions and not the specific fraction that's used uh, from a particular equivalence class. So if we've got two equivalent fractions and two other equivalent fractions, then uh, these two added together are going to be equal to, to these two, uh, equivalent to uh, these two added together. Um, theorem 57, uh, it's another kind of um, property that we're already familiar with regarding addition of fractions, and that's if we've got two fractions that have the same denominator then um, we don't need to faff around really with this. We can actually just add the, the numerators together and that forms the new the, the numerator of the new uh, fraction uh, of the sum of the two fractions. So again, there's not really much for me to, to say about that. Theorems 58 and 59 uh, just prove the commutativity and associ associativity of addition of fractions. Um, Oh, now up to theorem 67, which I'm going to go through in a second, the theorems are, are fairly uh, routine, trivial uh, theorems. There's there's nothing really interesting about them, so at the risk of um, seeming like I'm just skipping over a, a, a huge portion of this section, um, I'm going to jump straight on to uh, theorem 67 now. So theorem 67 is quite a significant theorem um, concerning fractions. It says that if x1 over x2 is greater than y1 over y2, then this is if you think of this as maybe an equation, uh, y1 over y2 plus u1 over u2 is equivalent to x1 over x2 as a unique solution u1 over u2. So unique um, is meant in the sense that if you have two solutions, uh, they will be equivalent fractions. So they're not necessarily equal because we don't have a, a concept of equality of fractions, but they will be equivalent uh, fractions. So uh, unique um, has a, a very particular meaning in this context. Um, so this is, like I say, think of this as effectively some kind of an equation. So equations of this form satisfying this condition have a solution. If I were to switch this uh, inequality symbol round, uh, this wouldn't have um, a solution. So I'm not going to uh, spend too much time thinking about the uniqueness. Actually, this uh, follows, uh, the uniqueness of the solution follows from a previous theorem, I think theorem 63, which I've not mentioned, um, but it's, it's not really what I want to focus on. So I'm going to concentrate on the uh, actual existence of the uh, solution to this um, equation, uh, if you want to call it that. So, uh, from this, it follows that x1 times y2 is uh, greater than uh, y1 
X2. So this is definition nine, uh, allowing me to make that, uh, that conclusion. So therefore, since these are natural numbers, and thinking back to the, the theory uh, relating to natural numbers, um, what it means for a natural number to be greater than another natural number means that there is um, a, natu oh, a natural number u such that uh, this inequality symbol can be made into uh, inequality. So what we're going to do is we're going to set uh, u1 equal to uh, this u and this is a, a unique number uh, so when it comes to natural numbers um, the the number that kind of brings this side up to equality with this side is a unique natural number so this makes sense set u1 equal to to u and set u2 equal to um, x2 y2 okay so what we get is that uh, y1 over y2 plus uh, u1 over u2 is uh, equivalent to y1 over y2 plus uh, u over x2 y2 and using the result from theorem 40 uh, y1 over y2 is equivalent to y, uh, sorry, x2 y1 over uh, x2 y2 plus u over x2 y2 and okay I, I can switch those around just using uh, commutativity uh, of multiplication of, of natural numbers. So I get y1 x2 over y2 x2 plus uh, u over uh, x2. I, I can switch these two around as well, y2 x2, which is similar to uh, theorem uh, I can't remember the, the number, it was one that I did a couple of minutes ago. We've got the same denominators here, so we can just add the, the numerators together. So y1 x2 plus u over uh, y2 x2. Uh, but y, y1 x2 plus u is just equal to x1 y2. over uh, y2 x2 which is similar to x1 y2 over x2 y2 again commutativity uh, used on the, the denominator here which is using theorem 40 uh, similar to x1 over x2 which is exactly what we needed to show so therefore the uh, particular solution that we want is, well, it can either be this fraction that we've got here or any equivalent fraction. Remember that addition of uh, fractions is um, only depends on the class uh, of fractions that that fraction actually comes from, not the particular fraction that's chosen. So any equivalent fraction to, to this one uh, would also work. So uh, We've got the existence sort of uniqueness, like I said, follows from uh, theorem 63. And, okay, I'm going to leave that there. That's, that's done and dusted. And I'm going to move on to the next part now. Something that I almost forgot to include, actually, um, is this definition, definition 14, um, which says that the specific uh, u1 over u2 that's being constructed as part of this theorem 67 is denoted by this symbol. So x1 over x2 minus uh, y1 over y2. Now, I'm just going to give a bit of a, a word of warning about this. Um, I personally don't see this as a genuine subtraction. 
so x1 over x2 subtract y1 over y2 for several reasons. One, um, subtraction hasn't actually been defined and it isn't defined on fractions um, in Landau's book. So the reason for this is probably because subtraction doesn't really contribute anything to the overall development. Um, it, it's unnecessary really. So the uh, the goal here is to, to to get to the construction of the reals by the most um, by as efficient a route as possible. So to to go branching off and defining subtraction when we don't actually need it would be a bit of a distraction. So I don't see this as a genuine uh, a genuine thing uh, subtraction a genuine operation. I see this as uh, basically a single symbol, an inseparable symbol. So obviously it's written quite suggestively to hint at um, the relationship that, uh, that there is, to give an idea that there is a relationship between this U1 over U2 and these fractions around it. Um, but I wouldn't think about it as literally uh, a fraction minus another fraction. So uh, another reason for this is that um, there's, we've got no concept of negative fractions. In fact, we don't even have a concept of positive fractions. We've just got a concept of fractions. Um, so we can't just go uh, kind of wielding this uh, operation willy-nilly and subtracting any fraction from any other fraction that we want because then we might end up in the situation where we're trying to subtract a fraction um, that is uh, greater Invalid. This y1 over y2 might be might be greater than x1 over x2, and that was kind of take us into negative fraction territory, which we we don't understand at this stage. Intuitively, we understand it. We know that fra negative fractions do exist, but um, as far as we're concerned, um, at this point in the book, uh, in this development, they don't exist. So we can't just kind of throw this symbol around and start subtracting any fraction from any other fraction that we we feel. I see this as a single symbol and I think about this as the fraction um, such that when it's added to y1 over y2 I get a fraction that is equivalent to x1 over x2. In other words I'll get that uh, y1 over y2 uh, plus uh, x1 over x2 minus y1 over y2 is equivalent to x1 over x2. So it's, you've got to be very careful how potentially you think about this. It might be legitimate in a way to, to think about rearranging this. Um, I'm going to call it an equation, rearranging this equation by subtracting uh, y1 over y2 from both sides. Um, but again, I personally don't think about it in that way. I'm not saying that it's wrong necessarily, I just personally don't think about it in that way because subtraction is not a defined operation um, um, as far as we're concerned at this stage. So finally, uh, for this section on fractions, uh, we define multiplication of fractions, which is defined uh, as follows. Um, x1 over x2 uh, multiplied or times by y1 over y2 is equivalent to the fraction x1 y1 over x2 uh, y2. Sometimes this dot will be uh, omitted, usually it will be um, in the, the way that it's um, it's usually omitted anyway uh, when we do normal uh, arithmetic multiplying fractions and things like that. We don't usually write any kind of symbol between fractions when we multiply them anyway, so that's not really any surprise. Theorem 68 is analogous to um, a theorem, the theorem for addition in that uh, multiplication of fractions it only depends on the, uh, the, the class a fraction um, that a particular fraction is from, the equivalence class uh, and not the particular representative that's chosen from that equivalence class. So that's what this uh, this theorem is, is saying here. Uh, theorem 69, 70 and 71 uh, cover the uh, usual 
a kind of um, uh, elementary properties of multiplication, commutativity, associativity, and distributivity of, of multiplication. And then we come on to theorem 77, which I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time just going through. Um, so obviously, yeah, I've, I've missed out uh, the theorems 72 to 76. They're not very interesting theorems. They're, they're really, they're necessary. Um, but they're really saying things like if you've got uh, x1 over x2 is greater than y1 over y2 and z1 over z2 is equivalent to u1 over u2, then uh, this multiplied by this will be greater than this multiplied by this. So it's it's really, th there's nothing particularly interesting. It'd be a, a bit of a snooze fest if I were to, to go through all of the, the theorems. So I'm going to jump straight to um, theorem 77. Again, it's it's like a, a solutions to equations kind of thing. So I'm going to call this an equation, even though it's not it's not an equal sign here. It's uh, an equivalence uh, symbol. So the equivalence um, or the equation y1 over y2 multiplied by u1 over u2 is equivalent to x1 over x2. For given x1 over x2 and y1 over y2 has a unique solution u1 over u2. Again, this ter this uh, word unique is being used in a very particular sense here, so it, it doesn't mean unique in uh, necessarily the normal sense as there's, there's only one. Actually, there's going to be an infinite number of solutions to this, but they're all unique in the sense that they all belong to the same equivalence class. So we're using this in a very specific way. Um, again, I'm not going to focus on the uniqueness, I'm, I'm going to concentrate more on the uh, existence of uh, the solutions. The uniqueness follows uh, straight from theorem 73, um, which I'm not going to go through. Um, I'll just try to keep things as, as brief as possible. So, uh, let uh, u1 equal uh, x1 uh, y2 and uh, u2 equal uh, let me think, x2, y1. So therefore, uh, y1 over y2, u1 over u2 is going to be equivalent to um, y1 over y2 times uh, x1, y2 over x2, y1, which is equivalent to using um, commutativity, um, x1, y2 over x2, y1 times y1 over y2. That is equivalent to using the definition, definition 15 for, for multiplication, that's going to be x1 y2 brackets y1 over x2 y1 brackets y2 and then I can use um, associativity of multiplication for natural numbers to say that that's going to be equivalent to x1 uh, y2 y1 over x2 y1, y2, which is, now I've got to, uh, I've, I've kind of messed it up a little bit here, but it says y2, y1 in the top there, and I want it to be the other way around, so I'm going to have to use uh, commutativity, again of natural numbers on what is in the bracket here. So I get x1, y1, y2 over x2, y1, y2. And that's equivalent to, by theorem 40, which I approved earlier in the video, that's equivalent to x1 over x2. So therefore, this u1 over u2, which I've defined here, uh, it, it satisfies this, where is it, this uh, equivalence here. So the solution, therefore, is u1, u2 equal, uh, sorry, not equals, is equivalent to um, x1, 
y2 over x2 y1. So this is kind of what we'd expect anyway from from our um, coming back to our intuitive notion of uh, multiplication and things like that of fractions. There is no division of fractions defined in Landau's book, but this is what we would get effectively um, using our intuitive notions of, of operations on fractions. If we were to divide the fraction uh, x1 over x2 by y1 over y2, this is exactly what we'd get. Um, so it's, it, it coincides exactly with what we expect. So there's not really any surprises there. And with that, that brings us to the end of uh, the section specifically on fractions. Uh, the next bit uh, in the next video that I'm going to go on to is, um, strictly speaking, it is part of the, the section on fractions, but it's talking about um, rational numbers. So I'm going to treat that as a separate topic in the next video. So thank you for watching this video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.